All right, hang on a second. All right, welcome back. I think everybody's getting in to the session. Welcome back. Today is day three of our Natural Resource Management Academy. It's so good to see so many of you back here. Um, we're on just a slight delay. Our presenter is having some internet issues and just is uh, texting me. And uh, so I'm sorry, I'm slightly distracted. But what we're gonna do today, like we've been doing, so for those of you who have been here already this week, um, you have already met me, but for those who today is the first day, I'm Lauren Traster. I am the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator with UVM Extension. I apologize, I just need to do something. So this program is done in collaboration with the Vermont um, Fish and Wildlife Department, and with me today is Hannah Phelps. Hannah, if you want to give a hello. Hi guys, I'm Hannah Phelps. I help run the Green Mountain Conservation Camps, which is where we normally hold um, the Natural Resource Management Academy, but this year it's all online and we are having a blast with it. So um, as we have been doing, what we like to do is introduce ourselves to one another. So find the chat box and if you could um, tell us who you are, where you're from, and today's question is, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? So let's see who we have here today with us and what your superpower would be. Oh, Brenna wants to have the ability to talk to animals. That's a good one. Mm. <laughs> and be invisible, Eva, yes. Ashton is fly. You guys also tell us where you're from. Because we, you know, some some people are coming in new today, but I love your superpowers. Shape shifting is is that where you can like kind of fit in and like be in different places? And that, you can I didn't even, pretty much I did not even into, explain that right. <laughs> shape shifting generally means you can turn into anything, um, so animals or objects or anything like that, um, but. I don't know who said shape shifting. Jasmine says shape shift. So well, I've seen a couple of shape shape shifting. Sage from Maine yeah. just did it. Uh, Xander wants to have atomic manipulation. <laughs> you guys, these are all good. They're going by so fast, but I've seen speed and super mm -hmm. strength and uh, manipulate manipulate gravity. gravity. That's a cool I one. Know. These are all good. Welcome everybody. So keep introducing yourselves. Let us know who you are, where you're from. I, you know, I'm going to agree with Brenna. I would love to talk with animals. Hannah, what would yours be? Um, I think I'd really love, well, oh, okay. I, I think I'd really love to fly. I'd also love to be able to breathe underwater. So I think it's a tie between those two. Well, the water one is very timely for today's topic. So um, I want to remind everybody, um, for those of you who've been here before, you know I'm going to ask you to rename yourself. Put your first, um, either your last full last name or at least your, the initial of your last name. So go to the participant list, rename yourself. We need to do this because I know many of you are going to be here all week and we're tracking that because if you come all five days, you'll get a certificate of, of attending the Natural Resource Management Academy. But we also do need to just gather an accurate participant list. And that's just for reporting that Hannah and I need to do. If for some reason you are not able to change your name um, or it's just something you don't do, then I need you to private message me and just let me know what your name is. So that would only go to me. Um, otherwise, I will be private messaging you to find out who you are. Because again, we do need to get an accurate um, list. So, and you know, it's good um, online, um, it's a good online habit to have your name reflect because when we're in an online environment, this is how we know when we create community and we're spending the week together. So it's a good thing. So Hannah, if you could go ahead and put in the chat box, if anybody needs the closed captioning services today, um, Hannah's gonna put that link into the chat box. All you need to do is click on that and it will take you to a separate site where you'd be able to um, see, see the closed captioning for today. 
So I want to remind you all of our protocols for when we gather in what I like to call Zoom land. Um, everybody stay muted unless um, you raise your hand and ask to be unmuted to answer a question that might be asked. Um, I know many of you have not wanted to do that, but we do encourage you that if you do want to answer or make a comment um, by speaking, just let us know. You can raise your hand. That's an option and we'll call on you and, and we'll let you speak out. Otherwise, we use the chat box. Um, I know our presenter today is going to do a lot of back and forth. And as you know from Monday and Tuesday, if you were here, we do use the chat box quite regularly as a way to just have a lot of back and forth conversation. Um, please don't use the chat box inappropriately. We want to be courteous and respectful, not only of each other, but also to our presenters time. Um, so the chat box is, is meant to stay on topic. So don't create any distractions with the chat box. And also, if you choose to have your video on, just make sure that you're not creating any distractions like making silly faces or moving around your house. Um, feel free to keep your video off. We are recording today, just so you know. And so again, you don't have to have your video on if you don't want to. Um, have your first and at least your last initial showing and then stay engaged, participate fully. The last two days, Hannah and I have been commenting, you all have been amazing. We have just truly loved how engaged you've been with the presenter. So hopefully uh, that will continue today. So as you all know, today it's a, we're doing a, uh, a series this week. Today is day three. We have two more days after this. You can come all the days or pick and choose the days. We just hope you come to as many of these as you can. I do want to mention a couple of other opportunities that are going to be coming up. So we do a Summer of Science series, and this week is actually part of that series, but normally we have what we call Teen Science Cafes every Wednesday from 1 to 2 o'clock. Um, so next week, we will have a Science Cafe on Wednesday. You can go to this website and see what topics are remaining for the summer. Next week is a cool one. It's on veterinary infectious diseases. Um, we have a, 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 a professor of animal sciences at UVM coming in and, and sharing his research. And it's very timely as it it's kind of relates to coronaviruses and different zoonotic diseases. So highly recommend you checking that out. And then new that literally just came off the press is yesterday. Um, one of my colleagues is going to be working with the College of Engineering at UVM to create first robotic um, clubs around the state. We're really trying to increase participation in the first robotic competitions and, and get robotics really up and running. And so they are um, looking for uh, first robotic ambassadors. So we're going to have a very special quarantine time session on Monday, July 27th. For anybody who thinks they would be interested in becoming an, a teen ambassador in that program. Um, so that's another cool opportunity. And then another program that I run in the fall is the Youth Environmental Summit. We usually have an in person gathering at the end of, end of October, early November. But this year, we're going to have to actually go to a virtual um, conference. And I have some really cool ideas for it. But right now, I'm soliciting presenters. And we have presenters like we're having this week, you know, people that are environmental professionals, but we also have student presenters. So if you think that you have, um, maybe you've done a project with um, your school green team, or maybe you've done some work on your own and you want to share your knowledge, I highly encourage you to submit a proposal. Uh, I extended the deadline to today, but it's, it's still extended. So you can find the information on this website and just submit a proposal. I would say give it, you'd have to probably till mm, maybe another week or two. You can reach out to me too if you think you want to submit a proposal. And then I'm going to have Hannah pop in the chat. I just discovered when I was on Facebook before coming on today that this Saturday is the annual Loon Watch. Um, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, which our presenter tomorrow is from, that their loon um, conservation biologist has volunteers go out all over Vermont to, do, uh, to, to gather information on loons on Vermont lakes and ponds. And so it's kind of like a citizen science project and it's happening on Saturday. 
And so if you think you might be interested in, in getting involved, we just, I, Hannah just popped in the information. You can go to that site to learn a little bit about it and contact um, the loon biologist to get involved. But I would say I, I would probably do that today if you think you might wanna get involved in that. So I just wanted to share those opportunities with you. Um, so this is very timely. So today's icebreaker, because we're gonna be focused on water and watersheds, um, let's find out what is your favorite activity to do on the water. And you can just pop it into the chat box. Um, a, B, A is snorkeling, B is fishing, C is kayaking, D is surfing, E is, what are those things again? Um, jet, ski. jet skis, thank you. <laughs> Oh, we got a bunch of C's coming in. I see a few A's. For kayaking for C, that could include also canoeing or paddle boarding. I stand up paddleboard. That's my thing I love to do. And I do it with my dog who <laughs> loves it. He actually was on the cover of Vermont Sports two years ago on, on his sup. <laughs> so he's a little famous. Oh, this is great. Yeah, Eva, also just swimming. I know, there. I could have put in so many options, um, but that's great. So I love that you all shared. We're not gonna go to um, have anybody share out. I think you guys did great. What I am curious, um, Hannah, is Ashley with us yet, or do you have her presentation? She is, she's gonna share it on her screen and, okay. and call in so she can talk to us. Great. So I'm going to, let's introduce her then. Awesome. Um, so today, you guys, we have Ashley Eaton with us. She is the Watershed and Lake Education Coordinator for the UVM Extension Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Um, she oversees the Watershed Alliance Program, which has a UVM and a SUNY Plattsburgh location. She coordinates watershed science uh, professional development opportunities for K through 12 teachers and oversees an undergraduate watershed education internship program. Um, so she has her bachelor's de degree in education and environmental science and her master's in natural resources from UVM. Um, I'm really excited to have her talk to us. Her presentation is called Watershed Wise, explore local water quality challenges and learn how you can make a difference. So Ashley, if you are ready, you can take it away. <laughs> Let's see. I need to. We find might have to make her a host. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. I just I'm trying to find her. Oh, there she is in the list. Okay, Ashley, just bear with me. Okay, Ashley, you are now a co-host, so you should be able to control your mic. Or maybe you're on the phone. I think the phone number is also her. All right, so let me change that then too. Yep, she said, yeah. Yeah, no, that doesn't, I'm not allowed to do anything with the phone number. You just unmute it. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Oh, okay, great. I just got a little notification that I was unmuted. Hey, everyone. Can you all see my screen now? We yes. can. And can you hear me okay? Yes, and if anybody can, why don't you guys, yeah, put in the chat boxes. Does her volume sound good to you guys? Okay, and you can always up the cool. volume on your personal computer if you need to make Ashley louder. That's what I always do. <laughs> okay, that is great. All right, awesome. Thanks everyone um, for being here with us today. I'm sorry that I can't um, share my screen, but I've got a couple photos here to introduce myself. Um, so thanks so much, Hannah and um, Lauren for the introduction. So yeah, I'm here and I'm gonna to talk to you all about watershed science. And we're gonna talk a lot about the challenges here in the Lake Champlain Basin. But um, to kick things off, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about why I do the work that I do here for Lake Champlain Sea Grant. So there's a couple of photos of me. Um, Lauren, actually, it's kind of funny. You were just talking about how you always paddleboard with Humphrey. And this is me and my dog, Callie. And so she's a big paddleboarder too. Um, and so I grew up here in Vermont on Lake Champlain and Lake Champlain was just a really important place for me. Um, and I think that is just essential to the work that I do now. The, the work we do with communities and educators and students, um, it's really clear that people who care about the environment 
um, tend to want to steward it and make sure that you know things are really taken care of. So I want to start with a little activity. If you can, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about your favorite place that you've ever been, whether it's on water, in water, near water, some place that is really special to you and that has to do with water qual a, a watery space. And then in the chat box, after you kind of have that mental image, I want you to just put the name of that place. It doesn't even have to be in Vermont. It can be anywhere that you've ever been. But I'm curious where you all, what are some watery places that you love? and then put one word that describes that place. So for me, you'll see the picture on there is Woods Island out on Lake Champlain. And the word that I'm using to describe that is sunset. So there are just beautiful sunsets there. So we've got Alaska, oh, I bet, York Beach, Maine, Half Moon Island, Peaks Island, Maine, awesome. Memories, peaceful, tranquil, yeah, epic, <laughs> awesome. So that is really, important to the work that I do before we even start talking about the science, it's just building a connection to place and building a connection to water. So the work that I do for Lake Champlain Sea Grant, um, looking at this photo, I'll give you a couple seconds, look at this photo. So all of those yellow dots are programs that are affiliated with this NOAA organization that I work for. And what do you notice about the location of those dots? Where do they tend to be? You'll notice there aren't any in the center of the United States. And you can, if you've got guesses, put them in the chat box. Yeah, all near water along the coast, exactly. So I work for a program called Sea Grant. That program is funded through NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the gist of it really is that Sea Grant exists to help people conserve and protect water resources. So whether you'll see some of those photos, I'll go back, are on the ocean. Some of them are out on the Great Lakes but it's all about protecting water and then working to do research and um, build the economies of those places. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk about my awesome colleagues. So I work with this fleet of folks here in this photo. They are amazing. And I'm gonna talk about a lot of the work that they do actually, um, and a little bit less about the work that, that I do. But basically, we are all doing research and education around water quality issues. And I'm going to break down kind of the big challenges that we're facing here in the Lake Champlain Basin. So I want to kick things off, actually. This is going to be our first polling question. Before we start talking about it, I want to know, what do you think is a watershed? So the options are, as Lauren's getting ready to launch that, A, a shed that holds water. B, an area of land where all of the water drains and collects in the same place. C, you guys, hang on, don't field. put it in the chat. We're oh. gonna launch a poll. Just give it a sec. Oh, sorry. This is, a, this is a pause for polling. And this actually is a good point. So throughout my talk, you'll see these slides that say pause for polling. All of these ones have a um, poll associated with it that Lauren will launch for you. Here, I'll launch so it right now so you can see. Um, and so your other choices, which, Ashley hasn't got to yet where a grassy field or the name of Vermont Lake. So if you see the poll, answer it right into the poll. Otherwise, if for some reason you don't see it, then you could put your answer in the chat box. Yeah, and Jeff, I'll try and help you. Jeff, we can't figure out why there are some people that just can't see the polls and we don't understand what is up with the technology, why, but it's, it's usually very few people. Yeah, and maybe that you have a pop-up blocker. That's um, true. It pops up as an additional piece. Ooh, lots of answers coming in. All right. So let's see here. Most folks have voted. So let's talk through this. A lot of you said that the answer was B, a lot which of is said B. a lot of people said B, and that is totally correct. So an area of land where all of the water drains. So this image that's on the right here shows you the Lake Champlain Basin. And this is a little confusing because it actually doesn't have the state. The entirety of the state's outline it just has the portion of new york and the portion of vermont that has the lake champlain basin within it so this outline all around the outside basically so this actually is the adirondacks over here so the adirondacks are on the western portion of lake champlain and they're kind of the the high point on the new york side and then over here on the east side we have the green mountains and so and then a teeny little bit of Quebec. And so that's kind of, this outline means that if any drop of water falls, it's gonna end up most likely at some point in Lake Champlain through the water cycle. And so the reason that I wanted to start with this kind of concept of a watershed 
is because the organization I work for is 100% watershed based. So we spend a lot of time, I feel like, talking about political boundaries. So Vermont, New York, Quebec, um, you know, all of those other kind of boundaries that we're more familiar with. But watershed science is really based in ecological boundaries and systems. And so if we look at this graphic here, we can kind of see, we can imagine that, you know, if these were the Adirondacks or the Green Mountains, this is kind of how it connects everything in one place to water quality. So um, in the work that I do sometimes, it can be challenging to get folks who do not live near Lake Champlain to understand the direct impact they have on the water quality of Lake Champlain. Um, I think if you live on the shore, it's easy to see all of the kind of impacts that are happening and to watch changes over time. But if you live farther away, it can be tricky. But what's happening right up here and kind of the, the higher elevation is just as important as what's happening down here at kind of the mouth of these streams. And so thinking about the systems, all the different biological and chemical systems that are involved in um, understanding water quality is really essential. It's not kind of one unit of study like biology or something like that. And so have you ever heard of um, or seeing these little Rus Russian nesting dolls where there's like one big one and then there's a smaller one and then a smaller one inside of that. So watersheds are the same. And so I wanted to give you some perspective. We're gonna be kind of locally focused on the Lake Champlain watershed, but I wanna think about where does our lake, where does the water from our lake go? How are we connected to the Atlantic Ocean? Because spoiler alert, we are. And so we are connected through um, basically, if you think if we started in the Winooski River, the water would flow into Lake Champlain. From Lake Champlain, it would flow th north through the Richelieu River into the St. Lawrence. And then the St. Lawrence actually is a seaway. And so it goes to the Atlantic Ocean. And so that's kind of how we're connected to the bigger picture, which is important because it means if we have water quality problems here, whoever is downstream from us theoretically is also going to have water quality problems, right? Because they're just going to keep compounding. So when we think about what kind of happens when watershed boundaries are created, this is just a little idea to give you um, to think about. If you're ever out and you're wondering, you know, what's the watershed or what's the watershed just near my house? Um, really, it's based on topographic maps. So looking at the elevation and how that changes um, in different places will really help kind of carve out where water is going to go in a certain area. So um, something that's easy to think about if you think about your knuckle, if you bend your finger, you kind of have all of those lines, those little crinkles and wrinkles. And so those are um, basically similar to the steep slope and oops, to the steep slope over here on this page. So this is kind of going to show you how you start to figure out where water is going to flow in a, in a specific spot. And there are people that spend a lot of time actually mapping this out um, for folks to figure out where pollution is going to end up when there are things like oil spills and um, things like that. So I'm going to tell you now why Lake Champlain is such a unique place. So Lake Champlain, as you saw from that photo of the watershed, there was a lot of land and not as much water. And so some of you have probably started delving into in your math classes, talking a little bit about ratios. Um, but the ratio here for the Lake Champlain watershed is so important and it actually um, really makes us a lot different even from the Great Lakes who are kind of um, our closest relatives in, um, in the freshwater world. And so thinking about this graphic here, you can see the ratio of land. So that means like acres of land is 18 and that is going to drain to kind of one square mile of water in Lake Champlain. So this, this um, graphic here kind of represents that. Now, without looking at any other figures, you might be like, okay, maybe that's just how watersheds are. Maybe all watersheds are like that. Um, and they are not. Lake Champlain is pretty unique in that watershed ratio. So this graphic shows you what the Great Lakes are like. And so this kind of pulls in, you know, whether it's Lake Ontario, Erie, all the Great Lakes, it kind of mixes them up together. But there, they tend to be more 50-50. So more of a two to one or even um, one to one ratio and then some of the bigger, the bigger Great Lakes are five to one, but you can see that this is vastly different. And understanding this is really fundamental to what I'm gonna to explain today. So when we talk about water quality, we talk about water pollution, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about 
you you probably think that we spend a lot of time out on the lake studying, but what we actually do is we spend a lot of time on the land, figuring out what's on the land and how that's going to end up in waterways. So these are all of the major rivers in the Lake Champlain um, basin here. These are kind of the big ones, the big tributaries. And so go ahead and see if you can figure out which one you live near. Maybe you live closer to some of these. I live in the city of Winooski, and so I live really close to the Winooski. Um, probably like I could almost see it from my front porch. Um, but I'm curious where you all live in the watershed and what big rivers you might live near. Oh, Winooski, another Winooski person, Aaron, awesome. Winooski, great. Lots of Winooski. Lamoille, Meadowy, yeah. And you might even notice that some of the towns and counties in Vermont are actually named after these, named after these rivers. I think we're near the Otter Creek. Are you down near Addison, maybe? Ooh, nice. Oh, nice, Ava. Cool. So that's kind of a cool thing to think about. That's kind of how you're related to Lake Champlain. So your water from your house or your pool might be going there. And then this photo, I'm curious. I just came across this photo a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I actually have been to this place. It did not look like this when I was there. Um, but does anybody know what river this is on? This actually is a place where a lot of whitewater paddlers go to put in and run this little set of rapids here. Hudson. This is the Missisquai River. So this is right below the dam. So if you've ever been to Swanton, Vermont, there's a dam there. So this is right below it. So this is kind of cool because a lot of people don't think about um, whitewater, you know, kayaking or paddling here in Vermont, but there are some little cool spots. Okay, so I have to share some facts with you about the lake just to get you kind of oriented. So the lake is really, really long, super long and it's super narrow, 120 miles long from north to south. The water flows north, like I mentioned, um, and it's 12 miles wide at its widest point, which is basically kind of the Burlington to Plattsburgh area straight across there. And the deepest spot is 400 feet. And I'm gonna talk about, that's actually pretty important. That's um, pretty deep. It allows for some ecological features. I'll talk about those later. And there's 587 miles of shoreline all around the lake and the island. So if you're gonna walk around the shoreline of Lake Champlain, it would take you a very long time. And then the other piece that's really important to think about. So a lot of the work that I do is working on water quality, conservation and preservation for kind of marine systems and aquatic systems. But one of the other pieces that is really important is that 35% of folks here in Lake Champlain get drinking water from the lake. So um, it is important for aquatic life, but it's incredibly essential to our survival as humans as well. So let's start talking about some of the kind of characteristics and ecology of the lake. So on this graphic on the right, so all of these little sections, these are all segments of the lake and they're divided based on their ecological features. So Lake Champlain is actually a really complex um, ecosystem because of, like I mentioned, all the shoreline and all of the islands. But something that makes it unique is that each section, so you can see this is Missisquoi Bay, the Northeast Arm, we've got kind of this main lake area. This is where it's gonna be the deepest um, and the coldest. This section over here, Mallets Bay, and then we have the South Lake down here. And so the South Lake really functions like a river system. It's very shallow, it's very narrow as you can see. And if you were to look at the water, in, if you were just paddling or swimming, if you looked at the water, it would look very brown. Um, and it looks that way because there's lots of nutrients in the water. And so that is gonna you know, be really important when you're looking at the problems there because those are kind of the um, those are kind of like the indicators of what you're going to see. This section of the main lake is really deep. There is a lot of diverse fish communities here. There are a lot of spawning sites um, in this section of the lake. And this section of the lake actually is where water tends to stay the longest when it gets um, into Lake Champlain, spends the most time there. This section of Mallet Bay, very shallow, up into the northeast arm, very, very shallow, and then Missisquoi Bay, very shallow. And so something we start to think about is, okay, what is happening on the land? And so these are communities that tend to be um, pretty rural and heavily um, engaged in agriculture. And so 
they definitely are seeing nutrient runoff from that area, but they're also very shallow. So they don't really have a way to get rid of that, um, kind of get rid of that or store that, um, those nutrients in the soil like the main lake does. So just to give you some context on that front. So our next, okay, so this, don't put any answers in the chat box yet. This is gonna be a pause for polling. So we're gonna launch a poll. So having heard a little bit about kind of some of the physical characteristics being shallow, being like really turbid, meaning the water's kind of murky. What do you think those characteristics, what clues do they provide to water quality? Do you think that they help with the name of the lake? Do you think they help identify the number of research projects? Or do you think that they are indicators of water depth and turbidity? And I have just launched the poll. So again, if you see it, Take the poll. If not, just put it into the chat box. And again, if, I know a couple of people have shown up late. Um, please remember to rename yourself um, so that we can take an accurate attendance list. So we are checking um, so we can uh, know who's here. Awesome. It looks as if right. the majority has said water depth and turbidity. Nice. Yeah. And that is 100% correct. Yeah. Water depth and turbidity. So this photo on the right, um, you can toss it in the chat box if you know what's happening in this photo. Um, there's some pretty, pretty key components happening here. This is a cyanobacteria. Nice, Brianna. Yeah. So this is cyanobacteria bloom um, from Burlington, Vermont. And so this really this blue kind of green tint you're seeing that's really kind of like murky and it's on the top of the water. So um, this is probably one of the biggest challenges that Lake Champlain is facing. Yeah, eutrophication, exactly. And so we're gonna break that down and talk about kind of why that's a problem. So for the next few slides, we're gonna focus in on a few of the, the big challenges that are happening um, here in Lake Champlain related to water quality. And then we're gonna talk about some of the ways that we can mitigate or stop those, um, stop those negative impacts. So this slide just kind of shows an overview of what's happening here in our basin. And so overall, we have a variety of complex ecological challenges and they all are incredibly interconnected. Um, and so you really can't evaluate one without being somehow connected to some of the others. And so we're gonna talk about um, each of these. And one of the ones I'll just touch on because I actually don't have a slide on this is crude oil transport. And so this is uh, relatively new to our research queue, but we have been looking at um, developing emergency response plans for the rail lines that travel on both sides of the lake in Vermont and in New York. Um, and thinking about when they are transporting hazardous materials such as like crude oil. How would we respond to that? Um, and what would the like kind of what would the community response need to be in terms of marinas that are nearby? Um, how would we deal with wildlife in that situation? How would we contain this bill? And what is like the chain of command um, to solve that? If that was a problem, we have not had a big um, crude oil bill here in Vermont in the recent history, but um, we do, there does tend to be a lot of oil transport. There is not right now um, because of the pandemic, a lot of, um, I don't know if you like look at gas prices, if some of you are driving your own car, filling your car, but you'll notice gas prices are really low. Um, so actually a lot of crude oil transport has been halted because there just isn't enough demand for um, fossil fuels right now. So the first piece that I wanna talk about is phosphorus. And so phosphorus is a chemical element. You're probably familiar with it because you've seen it on the periodic table. Um, it is the piece that I'm gonna talk about in relation to water quality is organic phosphates, which are nutrients. And so those are commonly found in minerals, soils, natural waters, bones, teeth. Um, those are all kind of organic phosphates and things like agricultural, um, like waste or fertilizer, lawn fertilizer, um, all of that kind of stuff is really, really heavy in phosphorus. And the reason that we care about it, as we identified in that last photo, is because of the harm it causes through cyanobacteria blooms. And so cyanobacteria blooms are of concern because they can be toxic. And so I do want to be clear about this because I think it's pretty confusing sometimes, um, but not all cyanobacteria blooms are toxic. 
um, but some cyanobacteria. So there's like lots of different species within um, within the kind of like cyanobacteria umbrella. And so some of them do produce toxins at different times. And so a lot of the research right now is trying to figure out when the toxins are most present. Um, and so that helps us identify, you know, when can you, when is it safe to be in your water that has cyanobacteria blooms? Right now, um, we operate under kind of a, a blanket statement from a, a few different events that happened here in Vermont that if there is cyanobacteria in the water, you do not want to be in there. You don't want your pets to be in there. Um, there have been several instances of dogs that have passed away or died from um, drinking water that had cyanobacteria and it can be very, very harmful. It um, basically contains toxins that can attack your liver and it's just bad news. And so a lot of the times if you try to go to the beach and it's closed from a cyanobacteria bloom um, and it take it seriously because it can be very, very dangerous. Um, and so we usually talk about that in terms of total phosphorus. So phosphorus can be dissolved, organic, um, or solid. And so when we talk about it, we're talking total phosphorus, kind of brackets all of those um, different forms together. And then what really happens, this little graphic over here that I, it's very simple, but it's honestly exactly what happens. So when you have a lot of runoff, all of these things like soils or things that are really heavy in nutrients, when they enter waterways, you can usually tell because if you've ever gone out after a rainstorm and you've seen the water and it's been really like murky, um, or kind of like brown, that's because the water is carrying a lot of stuff. And usually that stuff has nutrients in it. When nutrients get into water bodies, like I was talking about St. Albans Bay or Missisquoi Bay, or generally the Northeast Arm, when it's really shallow and the water is really calm, um, that's kind of the habitat that these cyanobacteria love. And then as the water gets warmer, they tend to create blooms. And so, um, that's usually why we tend to see a lot of blooms at the end of the summer versus right at the beginning of the summer because the water hasn't quite warmed up yet. Um, so phosphorus from the landscape. So let's just identify a few places where phosphorus is gonna run off. So fertilizers, definitely whether that's gardening, um, agriculture, golf courses, anywhere that's fertilizing their lawn is gonna be a contributor. Pet waste is actually a really big one, which seems simple, but um, dog feces contains uh, pretty high amounts of phosphorus. And so we actually had a campaign where we had people like going around and hanging up signs and, that said, scoop up the poop. Um, and so that's one kind of little way that you wouldn't think one small um, piece of dog waste would cause a problem, but think about Burlington uh, in the spring when all the snowbanks are melting and everybody has been walking their dogs. And Burlington is on a hill and there is a lot of um, pavement and so it's just it's bad news in the spring. Agriculture can definitely be a contributor. Vermont is really wonderfully progressive in their um, plans to support farmers and farmers managing their their lands in a way that actually is really um, thoughtful to uh, agricultural runoff. So um, I work with a bunch of folks that have taken futures to farms that have really cool practices that they use. So they're either injecting manure or they are using specific manure lagoons that don't overflow or they're um, using um, rotational grazing. Like you can see here, this is from an organic dairy farm here in Vermont um, and they do rotational grazing, which helps um, with their um, crop management, but it also really helps with their water quality because they are not having a lot of erosion. Um, so you can see this nice grassy field. They're not getting a lot of erosion when they're moving their, their dairy herd from one pasture to another. Stream bank erosion is a really big one. And so this is something that you probably all have seen if you've been out kind of walking around. And so stream bank erosion happens usually when there is heavy water or a storm. And so you can see in this picture, all of these roots are exposed um, and the water is super low. And this um, basically just means that as the water is kind of like moving, it's so powerful, it's taking a lot of that sediment with it and a lot of that sediment has phosphorus bound to it. Um, and so that can be a really big problem. This is some stormwater runoff. So thinking about all of our kind of rooftops and paved areas, whether it's a driveway or a playground or something like that, um, if it rains, the water cannot infiltrate. It can't go into the ground and so it's gonna run off. And when that happens, the water moves a lot faster and it doesn't have time to access some of the natural um, filtration processes. So 
think about um, when you kind of walk on the grass and it's like rain, but it's a little bit wet, but it's not, you know, you're not stepping in a puddle. When you walk out onto a parking lot after it rains, you know, you might be stepping on a puddle because the water just has nowhere to go. And the last is forests. So forests do contribute a little bit of phosphorus um, to our total budget here in Vermont uh, that we are allowed to have. And so that's basically just organic matter. So looking at this picture, lots of dead leaves and stuff on the kind of on the forest floor. And so in some of the headwater streams that are kind of more heavily forested, you're just getting a lot of organic matter that's getting introduced through the tree canopy um, into streams. So, all right, this is a little confusing, but I felt like you could handle it and I wanted to show it to you. So this graphic here is a culmination of long-term data on Lake Champlain. And so let's just zoom into this Shelburne Bay example up here on the top right. And so what you're seeing is all, this is, these are the total phosphorus levels for each of these years. So you can see it starts in 1990, and it goes up to 2014. Um, and this graphic is from the 2015 State of the Lake. And this bar that goes across right here, this is the target. This is what the federal government would like us to hit. So this is where we are supposed to be with phosphorus entering um, phosphorus concentrations in the lake. And for this area, this is where we are. And the reason I'm using this example is because in Albans Bay also has incredibly high cyanobacteria blooms. And you can kind of look at this data and start to understand why. Like they're having these blooms and looking at the data, there is just really high levels of phosphorus. So you can start to hypothesize that there's some connection there, right? And then if you evaluate some of the other areas, like let's see, if we go to do, do like the Otter Creek system, and so they live near the Otter Creek earlier. So you can see the Otter Creek actually is very, very close to being right near its target. And so they're monitoring right here at the mouth of the, um, of the Otter Creek for that up here. Um, and so you can see that they're pretty close to being their target. And so one of the reasons that the work that I do is really focused on reducing phosphorus concentrations, um, both on the landscape that, that impact water, is because we have to, as a state, this is like a, a regulation. So we have a total maximum daily load that we are allowed to have entering the lake. And so we're basically, there's a lot of efforts. You may have seen like different organizations or heard different things that people are working on to reduce that from sectors of ag to sectors of urban planners who are doing green stormwater infrastructure, which I'll talk about. And so this is just kind of a neat way to see some of the long-term data. So if you're interested in data, watershed science might be a cool field for you because 90% of the work that we do is in data. All right, so you're probably wondering at this point, what can you do to help reduce phosphorus? And so kind of the big ones that I feel like are, um, you know, helpful just to, oops, things that you can do, you know, any day. If you have a pet, always pick up the pet waste and dispose of it. Um, building and maintaining a rain garden to catch runoff from a house or school is can be a really cool project um, because basically the garden, you're using ecological design to help filter the, the water. Um, mowing the grass, I don't know if your experience was like mine was in high school, but I got paid to mow our lawn. Um, and so I had a lot of say and when it got mowed. <laughs> and so one thing that you could talk to your parents about maybe is mowing the grass just a little bit higher. And then um, we didn't have a fancy lawnmower, but so we left the clippings naturally, but some of the new ones actually pick up the clippings. And so mowing the grass a little bit higher and leaving the clippings is really, really great for the grass itself. And the reason is because if you're not cutting a lot of the grass at one time, the grass actually can spend less time trying to like panic and regrow from the top and develop a really robust root system. And that root system is what really helps with water quality, both infiltration, so the amount that it can soak up, because the more surface area on the roots, the more water can take in, but then also kind of the depth and breadth of that um, root system. So if you think about it, if you were to like look at a lawn and be able to see both above and below, think about what that root system would look like. And then Ashley, washing cars on- Ashley. Oh, yep. Eva just um, popped a question in the chat asking, is it good for water to just let the grass grow completely? Oh, Eva, great. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Lauren. I can't see the, the chat box in my view right now. Yes, so um, 
yeah so the more natural a landscape is the better so if you think about having a lawn maybe you don't want to mow all of it maybe you want to let kind of some of it come back and it's shrubbery and um kind of like native native plants or something like that but that is definitely ideal um because it is kind of the most it simulates what the what that area would be like without um human intervention and so usually nature knows how to take care of itself a little better than um than we do so yeah letting that area go back to like a grassy field or something would be would be totally better yeah good for pollinators for sure yep so that's one cool way that um a lot we also have a program i'm not going to talk about it today but some of my colleagues work with um residential homes so people that just own homes but also businesses to um plant pollinator gardens rather than just have like a shortcut lawn which is a really cool um a really cool way to kind of add some aesthetic beauty and also work on water quality so thanks Ava. Uh, Lauren if there's other questions coming in feel free to 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 pop in because I can't have that chat box up. Yeah, um, I will. Yeah. Awesome thanks and then the last one is just wash cars on the lawn if you're going to wash a car you're probably going to use soap and so if you do that on a driveway um, versus on a lawn the water is going to run off really quickly maybe to a storm drain maybe to a nearby stream so if you do it on the lawn you're just using some of those natural processes a little bit more cool so for our next one in the chat box i want you all to we're going to talk about some aquatic invasive species and i'm just curious if you've ever seen an aquatic invasive species or if you know of an aquatic invasive species so if you have one that you know about go ahead and pop it in and then maybe i'll answer this there's a question in the chat box i'm just seeing so yes, if you do them a lot the, Dia's yep, asking yep, that. I have it open. Okay, great. So Dia's asking if you're washing the car on the lawn, don't the chemicals go into the um into the grass? And the answer to that is yes. And so a, the best case scenario is that you wash your car at a car wash, but I realize in Vermont that doesn't always happen and a lot of people wash their cars just at their house. And so if you are washing your car at your house, the best place to do it is actually on the grass because you're utilizing the natural root systems as a filtration process versus doing it on like a stone driveway or a paved driveway, which is basically just gonna um, move the water really quickly um, and kind of just amplify the amount of, uh, the concentration is gonna be really heavy and it's gonna enter one kind of water area versus kind of spreading it out, slowing the flow and letting, um, some of those root systems alleviate some of the the chemicals there are also you can be really intentional about the kind of soap that you use on your car there are some that are more eco-friendly than others which i would totally recommend and so let's see for our aquatic we've we got milfoil zebra mussels rusty crayfish um milfoil zebra mussels spiny water flea good one duckweed yeah there is like a yep there duckweed is definitely on the list cool so in clownfish yes so we have a host of aquatic invasive species here in Lake Champlain. And I just wanna make a note that if something is deemed like an invasive species, it means that that organism not only was introduced here, but it also has negative impact to the environment. And so um, the, the most recent ones were these two over here, the fish hook water flea and the spiny water flea. And most people are kind of familiar with zebra mussels. Those kind of got introduced in the mid 90s and kind of their population boomed immediately. And so one thing I want to talk about is how to get here and how we are looking in comparison to other areas. So the graphic on the right shows um, Lake Ontario. And so Lake Ontario has 184 and Lake Champlain has 50 aquatic invasive species. So usually when we talk about aquatic invasive species, we're usually not talking about totally getting rid of them um, because oftentimes that it really is is beyond that point in management by the time you identify a new aquatic invasive species usually they have spread and it's really difficult in waterways that are moving and that are very big to get rid of them so you end up doing kind of just like um, maintenance and, and management on the the population rather than trying to totally alleviate it um, so, um, Ashley, do you see Addison's asking, can you eat zebra mussels? Oh, Addison, what a good question. I do not know the answer to that. Um, I'm trying to 
Yeah, there actually is a huge movement in Vermont to um, eat aquatic invasive, uh, well, to eat invasive species in general, um, but I haven't seen zebra mussels on that list. So I bet not because also anything that filters water, um, I tend to think is not great to eat because usually they're taking a lot of stuff out of it. Um, so probably not, but that's an interesting question. And there actually are a lot of people who are doing research on um, how do we like use the invasives that are here in a way that um, could be more helpful? And then, oh, I'm just opening the chat box now. I see there's another question. Is there anything? Yes, I'm going to talk about how we can prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species because most of these organisms, as you can see on this um, slide here, they're not coming here on their own. So they're not packing up a backpack and coming over here. Um, you know, by train or car, as a driver, they are coming as hitchhikers. So oftentimes they're coming through canals or waterways, either on boats or in the exchange of water. Um, they are coming from home gardening. So actually there have been a few plant species that were introduced. This is purple loosestrife here in this photo that people just liked the aesthetics of, but it was not native here. And they planted it in a garden, not realizing that um, it actually was going to outcompete um, native species and spread rapidly. So some have been introduced just from planting um, at the house. Um, illegal stocking is one. Also, um, bait fish is another uh, another way that um, like fish species tend to get introduced. And so that is, um, I'm not sure how many folks here go fishing, and if they do, how many fish with live bait, but that's a pretty common practice and it's usually because it's really successful for the angler. And so um, something that happens is if you have a can of bait fish and either they get spilled or you're done fishing, you dump them out. That is how a lot of the smaller, um, the smaller fish have gotten into Lake Champlain through bait fishing. And then um, this little image on the left here is transport by usually boats. So whether that's boats here, like you can see kind of there's a bunch of, someone had mentioned milfoil, a whole bunch of people did. And so you can see there's like a whole bunch of aquatic plants tangled up in that boat motor. And then this last one, so props to whoever said the clownfish, because it actually is a huge problem is people dump either fish from their aquariums or um, other organisms that they have just out into like ponds and in natural areas where they um, it really isn't their native habitat and they do not belong there. Um, alewife, yeah, so that is, this is a little alewife right here um, in this top, and you can tell it's an alewife for a couple reasons, but alewife have a really sharp, if, you, we, if we could feel this, it's really bony and sharp all along the bottom, and alewife um, outcompete native um, smelt, rainbow smelt, so that is, um, that is who they're kind of impacting here in the Lake Champlain food web. Okay, let's see. All right, so what can you do? So basically, one of the best ways that we can limit the number of aquatic invasive species here in Lake Champlain is to just be really careful about moving things. So this is moving um, boats. So you can see like on the left, I've got a kayak, whether you're kayaking or stuffing, or if it's big motor boats, um, or also if it's any type of equipment. So if you're using waders and you're fly fishing, if you are, you know, bringing like buckets down to the water to like gather something, anything that basically could catch something or something could stick to, um, you want to make sure you're really cleaning it out, you're draining it, and then you're drying it. So um, a best practice is to, if you leave a boat out in the sun and it doesn't, you can't see anything on it, you kind of rinse it off and it dries for like 24 hours, most likely anything that's on that boat is, is dead. And actually, I'm curious if anyone has gone to any of the fishing, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Accesses and chatted with any of the boat launch stewards. So there are boat launch stewards at a bunch of um, different boat launches around the state and they're usually pretty cool. They're usually like um, graduate student or undergraduate students that are studying like fisheries or environmental science and they hang out at the boat launch and they chat with folks that are coming, bringing boats in and taking boats out and they'll do inspections. Um, and actually that program has been really, really successful. They have caught a bunch of um, so they have removed and identified a bunch of aquatic invasive species that would have otherwise probably been on that boat still when they put it in the water and um, have been transmitted. So that's kind of a cool program. 
one thing is to just when you're fishing use native live bait if you can try to avoid using fish that um fish species that aren't needed for this area it just makes it easier because if something happens and the bait gets filled you don't have to be you know worried about that and then keep an eye out so actually the zebra mussel the one of the very first people to identify um a zebra mussel here in lake champlain was a student um they had gone to a presentation actually and heard kind of the be on the lookout for uh for zebra mussels and so they found one and so that's a cool thing that you can kind of just see okay what's coming what's in the great lake somebody mentioned rusty crayfish that's one that is here and we are trying to kind of keep an eye on their population it doesn't seem like they've actually had a real big population boom in a lot of areas but um it could be just around the corner or maybe they're not doing as well here we, we don't know all right so next challenge and this one i feel like you all probably have been hearing a lot about this especially with the plastic bag ban that just happened here in the state of vermont but microplastics is a huge challenge and so um, you may have seen that there have been microplastics in found in drinking water there have been microplastics found in um, salt a lot of products that we consume which is pretty con concerning and it's concerning for two reasons so plastic as a product is um, challenging because it doesn't really break down so it doesn't break down and it actually can absorb chemicals that are in the water so think about heavy metals think about um, other kind of contaminants that you might see in water it can basically absorb them and then as they travel up the food chain bioaccumulate and so that's kind of one challenge here and you'll see so this image on the right is actually a fiber um, it's a microplastic fiber um, from a microscope micro microscope screenshot from a research project and um, these are actually some of the most common these little fibers here and they're pretty easy to identify because they're brightly colored you know they don't look like any of this other green stuff um, that's in this water quality sample and these are being found in um, plankton nets which i'm going to talk a little bit about maybe um, later so i saw that somebody popped something in the chat box they were like you can use a core ball yeah that is so true so one of the pieces about um, kind of reducing microplastics and waterways is in all reality using less plastic like straws and bags but also being really careful about washing clothing because a lot of our clothing is made from um, kind of nylon and polyester which is plastic based and so there's two little features here i have each of these at my house this is a core ball and this basically is modeled this was actually made by a woman in vermont which is really cool um, but this is modeled after coral and so it kind of like gathers the fibers they kind of stick to it and they get caught you can't see but there's little teeth um, behind the like underneath the little o that you can see and then the other one is this guppy bag and so this guppy bag is really cool because you can um, put clothes in it and wash it so this is made by patagonia i have one of those i usually use this for like fully sweaters so things that i know that are totally made of plastic that um might um, that might come off in the wash and i'm looking at this question in the chat box right now do you know microplastics do to people so let me go to i think i have one slide on this that is going to explain this yeah so this slide here um just shows you the different types of plastics so foam beads fragment film but this table is from a research project out of SUNY Plattsburg, and they are looking at um Oh, I think, um, Lauren, can you still see my screen? Yes, yes. Oh, you can't, okay. So something yep. is happening. Okay, uh, something nope. weird is happening over here. Nope, now you're not. Now you've been unshared. Okay, hold on, it looks like it just kicked me out. But while I'm logging back in, I can explain, um, I can explain that. So the reason that we are concerned about consuming microplastics is because they bioaccumulate, so they travel up the food chain, and as they travel up, each of those impacts gets amplified. So if you're kind of, think about if you were the first person to eat, or the first organism, so like, let's say a small fish, so you consume a piece of plastic, let's say it has some heavy metals in it, um, you know, okay, maybe you only consume a few, so it's not a big deal, but now let's say a bigger fish eats this fish that is, rather than ingesting kind of one piece of plastic at a time they're actually ingesting a fish that has eaten maybe 20 pieces of plastic over its lifetime and so as you start to like move up the numbers get really really big and so once i get logged back in here i'm going to show you i have a graphic and it shows basically we tested invertebrates 
fish and then um, cormorants is what uh, Dr. Danielle Garneau said. Yeah, Ashley, uh, while, you're, while you're logging back in, Eva's asking um, if you could mention again, what is the bag that you use to wash your clothes in? Oh yeah, it is Guppy, like um, G-U-P-P-Y, Guppy bag. Guppy bag, great. And yeah, why, and that's sold through oh, go Patagonia, ahead. I believe so. That. And while we're trying to get you logged back in, I'm going to ask, um, I'm trying to get registration. I can't match up. Uh, there's a participant, Claire S, and another one, Nancy C. I've been trying to private chat you. If you guys could let me know, I don't have a match for your name on my participant list. So if you could let me know, um, that'd be great. So that was Claire S and Nan uh, Natalie, Natalie C. You could let me know what you might be registered under because I'm not finding a match. That would be great. Um, Ashley Tovin is asking, why is the sample size for the cormorants so small? And how confident are you with the results? Oh, good question. So yeah, I can, yes, that is a good question. Um, so the sample size for the cormorants in this sample was 15. Um, so they sampled 15 cormorants, they sampled 197 fish, and then they sampled 509 invertebrates. And um, there, I did not conduct this study. This is the study of a colleague, but I imagine that there are two pieces that are really challenging. One is actually obtaining the organism that you want to study. Um, and two is that when you start to work with larger animals, um, and specifically when you start to work with mammals, um, the permitting can be different. And I know, so for this project, they were um, using acid baths. So basically um, taking whatever organism they were working with, putting it in um, a specific combination of, of an acid and basically dissolving everything other than the plastic. Um, and so I'm not sure, and they may have, this is data that I have from like a year ago, so they may have more information on that, but um, based on, on this now, uh, just kind of as a, Oh, sorry, I'm getting a lot of error messages. I don't know what's happening here. Um, but so it, it might be challenges with getting the organisms. It might be challenges with the process of actually dissolving them in the acid. It might be a permitting issue. So I don't know the, the details, but I would, from a science perspective, yeah, you would want a little bit higher end number to make you know real um, recommendations from that for sure. And then maybe Lauren, um, this would be a really good time while I'm getting logged back in if, other folks have questions um, that they want to ask now. I only have a few more slides, so. Yeah, that'd be great. So you guys um, definitely use this time to throw some questions into the chat box um, for Ashley. You know, as you all know, Vermont and our technology sometimes don't go together. So I appreciate you guys um, bearing with her, but Here's a perfect opportunity to ask Ashley some questions. So Sienna is asking, what is one of your favorite parts about your job? And you better oh, say Sienna. working with me. <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I will say that one of the things that I like about um, my job, so I do more education and outreach, um, and Lauren is totally right. So I actually really love working with um, all of our partners and all of our students and being able to work with, like I work with different people basically every single day. Um, and so for me, that is awesome because I love chatting with people. I love sharing about this place that I love and I love sharing knowledge um, and getting people excited to get outside and, and learn a little bit more and hopefully at the end of the day, make better choices um, when it comes to protecting our water quality here in Vermont. Um, and on top of that, so I have the perfect blend of I work with the public, but I also am in the Rubenstein Ecosystem Sciences Laboratory. So that's where my office is. And so I am basically like kind of on the front line of the research that's happening out on the lake. So I not only get to go spend way more time than a lot of my colleagues in the public eye and talking with people, but I also get to be really involved in what's happening on the lake. And actually, I sometimes when it's not a global pandemic. Um, I spend a lot of the summer supporting research and being out in the field um, on a bunch of projects, which is really neat. Um, oftentimes, if you're just a researcher, you really are focused on kind of one small piece um, of, the, of the problem versus being involved in, in kind of a diverse array of research projects. And so that's probably something that I really love too. Um, Olivia is asking, what other things can we do for local water quality? 
good question, Olivia. So I would say one of the biggest things that we're pushing right now um, at Lake Champlain Sea Grant is in the summer, we're really trying to get folks to think about how they're taking care of their lawn, planting native plants. Um, we are trying to get folks to think about maybe installing different things on their property. Um, so rain barrels, rain gardens, um, just slowing the flow of water. And then when it comes to thinking like just about choices that folks make, so making choices to use less plastic, Cora ball. Um, and then one other thing that we're working on, this is actually a winter-based project, but we're actually now working on doing some trainings and getting folks to think about using less road salt, um, which is not something that I have in my presentation today, but um, we live in a freshwater um, world here in Vermont and all of our water is fresh water. We don't have any, you know, um, saline, any water coming in from the ocean. And so it's really important that we don't add a lot of salt to our um, water because it changes the chemical um, makeup. And when it does that, it actually makes it uninhabitable for a lot of aquatic organisms. And so um, salt accumulates over time. Um, and so you can't really think about if you were to like take um, even just table salt and put it in water it would dissolve, right? And so once it becomes dissolved in, uh, in a liquid, it's really impossible to separate it and it changes the um, chemical properties and the ions in the water. And so that's one thing that we're working on now is looking at, okay, how do we manage salt applications so that our roads are still really safe and our sidewalks are really safe, but um, we're not you know, changing our freshwater, um, our freshwater properties. Okay, so we have, um, Lily wants to know, is the guppy bag made of plastic and not good for the environment? Good question, Lily. I actually do not know the answer to that. I would like to say that it's not, but I don't 100% know that. I wonder, I would say hop on the Patagonia website and look at it and see, um, and see what, it's, what it's made out of. Because that's, really that's a really good question. The core ball, just as a quick note, I do know this, the core ball is made out of recycled plastic. Um, so it's post-production, um, post-production plastic that has been recycled. And um, Eva is asking, how do we spread this now? Spread the information? I am not sure. Eva, if you could. She clarified her question a little further down. It's a little longer. Um, okay. Can you read it that? It says. Hang on, sorry, I just got to scroll for a minute. It says, how do we spread this knowledge and let people know why certain things they do are bad for water systems? Oh, got it. Good question. Yeah, and so um, I find like 95% of the time, things that are happening that are negatively impacting water quality, I feel like most folks actually just don't know that it's not great for water quality. Um, and so I feel like that's one... Oops, sorry. So I feel like that's one area where you could just have conversations with people and chat with folks about kind of your learning. Some of the work that we do with students is really focused on um, getting students to talk with folks in their community and change practices. So at your school or, um, you know, in your community, are there things that you could kind of start? So, for example, we now have the plastic bag ban, so that's going to um, reduce plastics. But are there other things like could your school be um, last year actually at the Youth Environmental Summit? I gave a presentation with some students who did a project with me where they actually um, changed their school cafeteria a little bit. And they had the year before they had gotten um, they had worked on a composting system, like improving that because they were getting a lot of things thrown out including silverware. And so they then um, worked with their school to figure out a way where they could switch from because they were using disposable um, silverware because it was more um, inexpensive than having to replace metal silverware that kept getting thrown out. And so I feel like there are lots of little projects like that where you could get involved. Um, and then also I would say, especially in high school, you can always reach out to organizations like the organization I work for, Lake Champlain Sea Grant, or um, you know, I feel like the state of Vermont sometimes takes interns and you can do an internship and work with us in the field and learn different things and kind of get ready for a career in um, environmental science. So um, two questions that kind of go together. Lillian wants to know what's the hardest part of your job? And Sophia wants to know what's the least favorite thing to deal with at your job? 
<laughs> okay, so I will tell you right off the bat, my least favorite thing, and I tell every single person this, is doing all of our written reporting and paperwork. Um, and so one of the things that, and Lauren knows this because Lauren does it too, um, we have to write a lot of reports and we have to like do a lot of like, I call it bean counting, but basically where you're like this many people went to this event and you and you have to like kind of write a story about that. And um, I really love doing the work, um, but I don't always really love um, having to write about it. And so that stresses me out at my job. So I would say that's my least favorite part for sure. And then um, the hardest part, was that the other question? Uh, yeah, the hardest part. <laughs> yeah, the hardest part. Um, I would say sometimes, um, since you're all high school students, sometimes the hardest part of my job is that it feels overwhelming. Like it feels like sometimes there's not going to be a lot of change in that things are not going to get better environmentally in terms of because these problems are really big and they're they require so many people to be involved in solving them um sometimes when i'm having a bad day usually it's because i'm feeling overwhelmed or like the work that i do actually doesn't um matter and so those days are pretty few but um it can be challenging especially with climate change to feel every day like you're you know fighting the fight and making the environment like uh healthy, happy place for, um, for everyone. So I'd say that's probably the, the hardest part. Well, I see we're back live on your slides, which is great, but there were two more questions if we could just answer them before you resume. Um, Katie yeah, wants totally. to yep. know, um, Katie's asking, where did the researchers get the animals to experiment on and are they dead or yep. alive? Good question. So Katie, um, one of the kind of less glamorous pieces of this a lot of the species work is usually done with um, organisms that are collected like with a net or or some other method and are, are not alive anymore especially for this microplastic study um, they were not kept alive there are some studies with, in fisheries where you can actually um, and there's, there's a video of this you can google this um, on youtube if, or look, look on youtube but of fish it's a process where you actually just make the fish vomit so you can retrieve the fish, make them vomit, and then put them back. But oftentimes they're, they're not um, held alive for this. But that's why the state of Vermont actually requires permitting for any type of work that um, you know, may cause a, an animal harm. You have to prove that the science is, that there's gonna be a, you know, a really good outcome for the science, that there's a reason to do it. So, and Aaron is, says, if we know there are high runoff areas near us or things like sewage overflow and stormwater overflow uh, dump places, yep. how can we go about speaking yep. to officials about measures to make it harder for things like phosphates and plastics to get into the river? Yeah, that is a really, that's a good question. That is a great question. And so some of that, there's kind of two components here and it gets a little bit political because you have to basically get your commute your town you have to convince your town that they want to invest money in that and that's what they want to do um, and so I feel like you know thinking about what you could do is to go to meetings like go to some of the city council meetings or write letters that's um, I've uh, been working with some students on that recently it's been super successful to some of the local and state officials to say hey this is a problem I'm concerned here's the information and data and science, here's why. Um, and then here's some thoughts I have on how we could improve this. Um, and then getting getting other, you know, sending that to other people, getting them to send it and kind of doing some of that grassroots stuff because the, the reality is for a lot of those changes, um, there's gonna be taxes associated with them. So people have to have the buy-in and wanna do it um, so that they can change because the combined sewer overflow is a really big problem and people know that um, in most towns, but it's so expensive to change that you have to really get people on board with making that change. And so I feel like that would be a cool way to reach out and do some of that community um, community work to get folks in the community informed and on board with that shift. So that's it for the questions for the time being. So if you wanna continue on with your slides. Okay, yeah, sure. And I just got a few more because I know we're nearing the end here. Um, so this is that, I just want to give you, you've all had a few seconds now just to look at this slide, but this is some of the preliminary results from that study. Um, and so you should be, um, you should be seeing that now, just to kind of see how, how that impacts the food chain and why as humans that would, you know, be really bad for us as well if we're eating these fish that are, um, you know, really high in microplastics. 
And these are, this is a note actually, it's important. These are all fibers. So these are specifically fibers which, um, you know, primarily come from clothing. And so they are getting discharged from wastewater treatment facilities. And this image on the left here is actually of that research study. And this is how they were. So this little green hose is the effluent. That means the water that's clean and leaving the wastewater treatment facility running through a um, micron mesh sieve here. And so they're basically evaluating what's in that sample, what's making it out of that, um, of that, you know, quote unquote, clean water. And so one of the other challenges is just stormwater. And so this is something that we are learning more and more about as we have um, kind of created our urban communities here over the last 50 um, to 100 years. And so looking at um, some of these pictures, you'll see it, there's just challenges around heavy rainfall, which we're starting to see, if you remember, last um, Halloween, we had a really, really bad storm that um, basically caused a lot of erosion, like this photo you're seeing here, um, really tore stuff apart um, in terms of forested and river ecosystems. But then also we just had a ton of water running directly into um, stormwater drains, which as, as um, I don't remember your name, but you just mentioned that this is a really big problem with combined um, stormwater and sewer. So if you think about piping from your house, you have water that is coming from the street like this, the stormwater, also the water that's coming from your toilet and dishwasher and all that stuff, and it's going to the same place to be treated. And in big rainfall events um, that we're seeing more and more with climate change, they overflow. So you're then getting a release of all of that, um, all of that gross untreated water. And then um, just eutrophication of waterways. So as there are more and more nutrients building up over time, we're just seeing more and more, um, you know, cyanobacteria blooms. There are better environments for various bacteria and pathogens. Um, and so those are kind of some of the big problems is, um, with stormwater. So these are, I won't talk too much about this, but I just wanted to show you some pictures. These are kind of um, from across the, the, um, the globe here, and they're all different um, green stormwater infrastructure practices. So basically that concept I mentioned earlier about using nature to, to filter water, this is kind of the basis of all of these designs. And so, you know, on the lower end, you're probably familiar with like rain gardens. On the higher end, you can see some of these really intense um, roof systems that, and I think in this picture right here, they're actually, this roof system is filtering the water for this building that's below it. Um, so some more complex systems. And the University of Vermont had a system like this um, that was filtering the, the water from the green roof as well for a, for a period of time. And so I just want to leave you with some ideas on, okay, so what's still happening? And I think um, something that is super exciting for me is that even though we have studied Lake Champlain so much and we know so much about it, there is way more that we don't know. Um, and I think that's really cool because I feel like sometimes the concepts um, that we tell ourselves and that we tell, you know, each other is that we know everything. Like, what is there to learn? Like, we know all of this stuff about the lake. There's nothing, there's nothing left to learn, but that's totally not true. Um, there are so many unanswered questions. And so we have a bunch of projects happening now that are evaluating aquatic food webs. And so thinking about the introduction of some of these aquatic invasive species that have now been here for five to 10 years and thinking about how have they altered um, food webs and how they altered ecological systems. And then how are the native um, species responding to that? So have they been able to endure and overcome and, and adapt? Um, looking at aquatic invasive species management. So with kind of increased travel, maybe not right now due to the pandemic, but as people are moving about more, there's just more chance for things to um, cross borders and cross lines and um, be introduced. And so how do we, how do we, how do we work with that? And then also how do we manage species that are already here. Um, for green stormwater infrastructure, this is kind of a hot new area in the term of water quality and watershed science. So understanding what practices are best, um, how do they work, um, identifying kind of like practices that can be in really small spaces is a really big area of research, which is kind of cool because you get to do a lot of design work um, and then testing out um, some theories. And then nutrient recovery is a really huge topic um, that Actually, a lot of research is being done on Lake Champlain right now, and how do we take phosphorus that's in the water, and actually, how do we get it out, or how do we remove phosphorus before it gets there? Um, and so, there's some cool research projects that you'll probably be seeing over the next couple of years, like in the news, as as we learn more about that. So, I think Lauren, that um, that is it. Kind of 2:20 right now, so I don't want to yeah. go terribly over. 
So while you guys but, think um, about, um, and Ashley, if you can unshare, um, I'm gonna share my yep. screen again. If you guys want to be thinking um, about if you have any other questions for Ashley, but while we're doing that, let's take a quick poll um, just for some feedback like we've been doing. So rate one to five, five being, you know, you learned a lot, rate what your learning is, and then we're gonna do another piece of, of that. So also be thinking about something you learned today. Don't put that in the chat yet. Just be thinking about that. But I'm gonna give it about another minute for everybody to just take this poll. Be thinking if you have a question for Ashley and be thinking about what something you learned today. And I also wanna say I appreciate you all being, uh, going with the flow with, with the tech the tech issues today, it is bound to happen. All right, gonna give it about 30 more seconds, try to get a couple more responses in. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. So what I would like you guys to do, are there any, I don't see any questions. What I want you guys to do right now is, we're gonna do a chat blast. And so like yesterday, uh, if you were here yesterday for our icebreaker, I want you to write in the chat box at least one thing you learned today, but don't hit send yet. We're gonna blast all at the same time when I say, so just write your one thing, just don't hit send. And while you guys are doing that, I'm gonna remind you, um, I'm gonna be sending an email later with the recording from today, as well as some at-home activities that Ashley has suggested for anyone who wants to go. Don't hit send yet. Hang on to your thing that you learned. Um, so uh, Ashley has given me a list of things that you can explore on your own. I'm gonna send that out in the email. And then tomorrow morning, you'll get the link for our session tomorrow, which is on citizen science and using um, iNaturalist, which is a cool tech tool um, to do some citizen science. So if everybody has written at least one thing, I want everybody on the count of three to hit send. One, two, three. Wow. Look at that. Okay. So some of the things learned, you need a license to cause possible harm to animals for scientific purposes, okay. Um, yep. <laughs> yep, I learned about cyanobacteria and phosphorus is bad for water systems. Um, just scrolling through a number of invasive species. Yes, your laundry contributes to microplastics. Do you know, so many people have no clue what, what their laundry, how it contributes. Um, I'm gonna personally say I love the question about the storm water and the runoff. My husband is a wastewater operator. And so if you wanna ever work on that end of things, um, you can actually be part of the operations that works on you know, preventing waste and, and, and doing the right thing with waste that comes through your wastewater. Um, that's a very interesting career to get into. Um, I wanna thank, First of all, I'm gonna stop sharing. I really wanna um, have us all thank Ashley for her time today and teaching us about her work and the work that um, they do at the Watershed Alliance um, in the Lake Champlain Sea Grant. I wanna thank all of you again for being fantastic participants, um, really engaging with the presentation. Hope to see you all again tomorrow. Um, we got two more days of Natural Resource Management Academy. And remember, um, if you wanna get involved in that Loon Watch, go check that out. Um, and if there are no other questions, we'll actually finish five minutes early today. So I'll just look in the chat, see if there's anything. And Lauren, can I, um, could I toss something out there too? Yes. I would say if you heard today's presentation and you were like, this is something I'm super interested in and I would like to, you know, dive into a specific topic that I talked about. Um, Lauren, I can put my email in the chat box and you can shoot me an email. Um, we work with tons of students that are interested in water quality and potentially either just 
creating change in their community or potentially a career in environmental science. Um, and so I'm happy to help and meet and chat with you or come up with some ideas, especially as we move into the fall. I think you all will probably have some neat opportunities to do some independent learning. And so there may be an internship opportunity or something like that. So I'll pop my email in the, in the chat yeah, box. Yeah, and, and I'll add, Ashley, your email is going to be in the email that I send out. So you'll get Ashley's email that way. I will mention Ashley oh, awesome. and I work together on a program that I was going to share at another time. There, there is a program that we do called Try for the Environment. Try stands for Teens Reaching Youth. And we train teens to teach environmental lessons to younger students. Normally, we train in person and then teens work, you have a, a team that you work with, two to four teens. You get trained in a, a specific curriculum and water is one of the curriculums you could get trained in. And then you go teach in a elementary classroom. With the pandemic and schools being a little bit different, we're actually changing things up this year. We're still going to offer it, but you're going to be trained to teach virtually. And so that, that opportunity will get announced um, at the start of school, and the training won't be till December. But if you think you might be interested in being a teen teacher, um, this year's topics are going to be, you could either teach in water, or waste systems. So those are only, we're only offering two curriculums this year. Normally we have five. If you think you might want to be a teen teacher, you can always let me know. So that way I make sure you get notified of the opportunity. So with that, like between myself and Ashley, Hannah and others, we know of a lot of opportunities. And so if there's ever something you're kind of looking for, just reach out to us and we can most likely connect you somewhere to have a good experience to, to get you um, further along in your learning. All right, so with that, we're gonna say adios for today. It was a pleasure and, and hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow, okay? Enjoy the rest of the Thanks, day. Thanks everyone. everyone.